Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindsay Thornton with NASA Langley Research Center here in Hampton, Virginia. NASA and the STEM Next Opportunity Fund are pleased to collaborate on today's special program. Through the Million Girls Moonshot, we are excited to share with you the importance of science and engineering in NASA's work. Now, today's program will be an interactive chat. Thank you for the many, many submissions we got with questions already. If you have additional questions, please continue to submit them in the link provided during registration. Now, we are thrilled to be joined by Pam Melroy, the Deputy Administrator of NASA. As Deputy Administrator, Pam has a huge job. She is a leader of the team that is responsible for creating the agency's vision and representing NASA to the executive office, including the President and to Congress. Pam has had a truly remarkable journey that led her here to her current job. Her career started with the Air Force as an aircraft commander, instructor pilot, and test pilot. She served as an astronaut, logging more than 38 days in space. And during her time in space, her missions assembled the International Space Station. As an astronaut, she was one of only two women to command a space shuttle. She then moved on to leadership roles in the astronaut office, including work on the development of Orion, NASA's new crew capsule. She's also had other incredible leadership experiences, including time at the Federal Aviation Administration and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Now, Pam holds a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from Wellesley College and a master's degree in earth and planetary sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now, we could keep going on for another half hour, uh, but we want to get to your questions. So Pam, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Lindsay. I think this is really cool. I have to say, when I was uh, a little girl growing up in the 60s, we didn't have anything like this. Uh, and it really would have been helpful for me because, well, let me just tell you, in the 60s, uh, girls were not really encouraged to think about airplanes and engineering. And uh, how I figured out that I was really interested in flying in space is that I used to fly my dolls around by their heads like they were airplanes. And I was always looking at the sky and wanting to be there. So I think this is a better way actually is for all of you to have the opportunity to talk to somebody who does engineering and uh, learn from each other as well. That's true, that's very true. Now it's an incredible time to be working at NASA. Can you share quickly just a few of the major missions occurring this year? Yeah, I'm so excited about this because there's nothing quite like a launch uh, that uh, gets your heart rate going. So, and in fact, uh, we're we're bringing a crew home from the space station uh, just this evening, and then uh, hopefully on Wednesday, if the weather holds, uh, we'll be launching the next crew to the space station. And uh, that's always exciting, uh, especially because I know some of the people on board. I served with them in the astronaut office, and it's always fun to see your friends go to space. But we're also very excited about the James Webb Telescope. It's the big telescope that's following on after Hubble, and it's going to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. And in addition to that, we uh, also are launching several other kind of science vehicles. But what I'm really excited about is Artemis One, which is our first mission to the moon since Apollo. It's a huge rocket with a spacecraft capable of carrying people safely out into deep space and back, which is quite a bit harder than just going to the International Space Station. And we'll be launching that in February. And won't that be amazing? Oh, I'm so excited, too. <laughs> now, you've had an incredible STEM journey. Looking back, what would you say is your favorite role? Well, that's a, a tough thing. I, I remember when I was a pilot in the Air Force and I loved the airplane that I was flying and the mission that I did. And then I became a test pilot and I flew lots of different airplanes. And I was a little nostalgic for the job I used to have. And uh, then when I went to NASA, sometimes I thought about how much fun it was to be a test pilot. 
And so every job has uh, something special to it, but you you carry all of those jobs with you and the experience that you have. I mean, certainly flying in space was the most fun, but in a lot of ways, the way I feel is learning is what's fun for me. And so uh, I love that feeling of starting a new job and a new challenge and trying to figure out how to do it well. Yeah, a lifetime learner. Mm-hmm. All right, so we've got some great questions. Our first question, and we've got the same question from a couple people. This is from Jenny in Fremont, Indiana, and David in Springfield, Virginia. What is the strangest and coolest thing that you've ever seen in space? Well, um, I have to tell you, almost nothing beats how strange uh, your hair looks in zero gravity. So I have pictures of myself, and my hair looks like a big cloud around my head. That's pretty strange. And some of my friends' hair look pretty strange too. But actually, the for sure, the coolest thing I've ever seen in space is that that moment when you undock from the space station. All three of my missions were to build the space station, so we brought a new piece up. And so when you dock, it looks a certain way, but then you use a combination of robotic arms and spacewalking and you add a new piece. And then you backed away from the station and there it was, this piece that you just added. It's a whole new view of the station that no one had ever seen before. So the thrill that I got as a part of a crew to say, oh my gosh, we did that. We put that thing on there. And I'll tell you, I wish you could all see the space station in person because it is very dramatic. It looks like a piece of modern art that's just hanging there in space for you to admire. That's amazing. So do, when it passes overhead, you go, oh, I built that. Just Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amanda from Lincoln, Nebraska, was wondering what specific jobs do aerospace engineers have in space and what are their roles on the International Space Station? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'll talk about on the ground for a moment and then in space. Uh, on the ground, engineers do such a huge variety of things. Sometimes they design new hardware or new software. Sometimes they analyze, so they study things to see what kind of hardware should we design. And uh, sometimes they integrate things so that they'll work. Sometimes they work on systems engineering with humans to make sure that humans can operate the system as well. Now, operations is a little different, uh, and I find it very exciting and fun. Operations is very high tempo and busy. It means you're doing technical things all the time, and you're on a schedule that you have to keep. And so, for example, the crew wakes up in the morning and they have a list of things they have to accomplish. Sometimes it's running a science experiment, which you better know how to run. Sometimes you have to either maintain or sometimes even fix a piece of hardware. So you have to know how to fix things. And you also have to remember where you put the screwdriver and the hammer, right? Because you have to go find them. And, uh, and But you're on a schedule and you have to get it done. And uh, there's a lot of different things that we do on the station, uh, but those kind of those are the kinds of activities. Oh, and if you're really lucky, you're getting to go on a spacewalk today. That is that sounds very lucky and a little scary, honestly. <laughs> now, uh, one of our students was wondering when you went to space, is there anything special that you brought with you? Oh, that's a wonderful question. It it really is. I think. Um, you know, for me, uh, going to space was such a special thing. I think it is for everyone. You feel really strongly about it. So um, there's two kinds of things. One, one kind of thing is something special to remind you of your trip in space that maybe you can give as a gift. So I, um, you know, would I, I would bring, you know, we had some patches and some other small items. I had some jewelry made and brought that back for my mother so that she could wear a necklace that had been to space. So sometimes it's that kind of personal stuff. And then sometimes it's just something that comforts you and that you're used to. So I'm a big reader. I love to read books. And every night before I go to sleep, I open a book up and I read for 15 or 20 minutes. And it just helps transport me out of the day into another place. And then I can start to relax and I'm ready to go to sleep. So I took 
a book on each one of my three flights. And uh, each night before I went to bed, I read for 15 or 20 minutes. Can you share what one of those books was? Well, actually, yeah, it's not not a huge secret. Um, my favorite author was Anne McCaffrey. Sadly, she's passed away. Um, but they were three books uh, that it were different books that she had written uh, that were favorite books. And uh, actually, uh, she she I got the opportunity to present one of them back to her. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Uh, she must have been thrilled. Yeah, oh, she gave me a beautiful leather bound version of the same book in, in exchange. <laughs> nice. Trade. <laughs> Um, now, I mentioned what you study in college, but um, Caroline in Washington, Washington, D.C. is wondering, do you have to study anything specific in order to work for NASA? Hey, Caroline, that's a great question. And I have to tell you, I wrote an astronaut when I was a first year in college to ask the exact same question. And the advice that he gave me, Steve Hawley was his name, was really good. He basically said, look, it's really important that you study in one of the STEM fields because what we do is very technical. You have to have a good grounding and understanding science and basic engineering. Uh, but, you know, he his advice to me was to follow the STEM field that I was most excited about and passionate about because I would be good at it. And that's really one of the criteria for becoming an astronaut. You have to be good at what you do. Uh, because it's very competitive and we want to send the best out when we're exploring. And uh, so I, I studied uh, Earth and planetary science and physics and astronomy. But astronauts come from all different backgrounds. They've studied mathematics and engineering, geology. Uh, we have doctors and even a veterinarian. So you should really find out what kind of science or engineering or math makes you really excited. And that's what you should study. Absolutely. You'll be much better at it if you're excited about it. All right, now this is a great question. Some people have compared being weightless in space to swimming. Is that what it really feels like or does it feel different? And that's from Maggie from Kansas. <laughs> well, thanks, Maggie. It definitely feels different. I will say that right up front. Now, we found out that uh, in a big pool, if you can become neutrally buoyant, so you have enough air and enough weights so that you don't float to the top of the water or sink to the bottom of the pool, it's pretty close. If you're in a spacesuit, you can practice your spacewalks uh, floating around that way. It allows you to do some things that we can't do here on Earth, like float, uh, go upside down. Uh, you don't usually do somersaults when you're in your spacesuit, but you could. So uh, it does give you that feeling, but I, I, I'll tell you, there is nothing as much fun as just floating around in microgravity. It's a, it's a very, very different feeling. If you relax everything, you sort of fold yourself up into this kind of weird zombie position. Uh, and uh, that's why in the picture of us sleeping, I had my hands slept sl in the t sleeping bag. Otherwise I looked like a, you know, a zombie lying there asleep. And you feel like you are at this incredible low energy state. And sometimes you feel like you simply could never break free of that because you're just at this really, really relaxed state. And it's just so much fun. That looks like a lot of fun. Now, a student from Vermont was wondering, could you see asteroids from space while you're up there? Well, well a small twist on that. Uh, if we were looking away from the Earth, it's really hard to see asteroids. In fact, that's a real problem for us with planetary defense, particularly if they're approaching the Earth from the direction of where the sun is in the sky. It's almost impossible to see them. And so that makes us a little bit nervous. And we're doing some things about that right now. But interestingly, if there's a, an asteroid or a piece of an asteroid or a piece of space junk, that is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere below you, I have absolutely seen them. They're like streaks in the sky. So when you see a meteor in the sky, it looks the same, except you're looking down on it. Cool. Now you mentioned the James Webb Telescope earlier and Aaron from Austin, Texas was wondering what scientists are hoping to learn from the James Webb. Oh, this is going to be really cool. I think we're going to see some 
Nobel Prize winning uh, science come out of this. So um, I have to explain, you may have heard of the Big Bang, which is the formation of the universe. And then all the gases kind of cooled down for a while. And uh, then they coalesced enough to start heating up again. And that's when stars and galaxies were formed. Now with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can look back in time, but only in the visible spectrum and a little bit of infrared. The James Webb Telescope will look in deep infrared and it will allow us to look back to that time in history, 13 and a half billion years ago, to when stars and galaxies began to form. Right now, it's very hard to see that time. So James Webb is super sensitive and it's going to allow us to look through a keyhole in space and see back in time. The other interesting thing that we figured out we could do with it, and this was after it had been designed to do that, is we can also turn that powerful capability where we see exoplanets exoplanets are planets that are circling other stars. Well, with James Webb, we're going to be able to look at the atmosphere of those planets and look for signs of life. And how exciting would that be? That's pretty crazy. And I know lots of students, lots of times we get questions about extraterrestrial life. And here we go. So you guys just got to pay close attention and find out what we see. That's right. Uh, now. Ashley in Delaware and some students from uh, an elementary school in Georgia were wondering what kinds of things, and you already mentioned this a little bit, um, what's a day like in space? Well, it, I'll tell you, it, it's a little different from when I flew on the space shuttle because the space shuttle went to space for about 10 days to two weeks at a time. And so we would plan these big missions, we'd train and rehearse on the ground. So every minute of the day was planned. Now, everybody has to take the time to get organized in the morning, right? Everybody has to go through the bathroom. We didn't have a shower on board the shuttle, but we could take towels and water and give ourselves kind of a sponge bath. And so everybody has to do that first thing in the morning. And believe me, it's a little crazy with six or seven people in a very small area all floating around and their hair is floating and their towels are floating. And then you have to wait in line to go to the bathroom. So it was always rush, 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 rush. And then we would go into a series of, of things that were very busy. It was scheduled. They were all closely interlocked. So uh, each crew member had a role and responsibility and you would take turns stepping into the spotlight. Okay, it's time for the commander to dock to the space station. Okay, now it's the robotics turn to step into the spotlight and lift a big piece out of the payload bay of the shuttle. Oh, now we're gonna hand over to the spacewalkers and they're gonna attach the piece and make the connections and so on and so on and so on. And everything was very, very busy. We did a lot of, a lot of spacewalks and a lot of robotics, especially while we were building the space station. On the space station, the space station is a wonderful, incredible national laboratory. One problem that we had with the space shuttle is that it only went to space for 10 days to two weeks. So if you were trying to do science in microgravity, it was a little bit like having a national lab that you had to shut down and then reactivate just for 10 days at a time. We wanted a place where we could do science 24 seven. So our astronauts have many experiments. And I mentioned there's also the routine maintenance Somebody has to actually reboot every computer on the space station every morning. And the reason for that is there are cosmic rays that are coming through the space station and they create problems sometimes on the computer. So just to be safe, we reboot everything every morning. That's an example of routine maintenance. So it, it's, uh, but that science is really important. And then periodically, sometimes you'll do a spacewalk, sometimes you'll have robotics, Sometimes the station needs to be fixed. Something breaks and you have to repair it. Maybe it's really small. Oh, there's a screw missing. I have to put that in. Maybe it's really big. Uh-oh, there's a problem with the solar array or we're gonna upgrade the solar array. So uh, it's, I think it's uh, a lot more now on the space station. You know, you don't actually know what you're gonna do for the day. You show up in the morning and there's, it could be anything. Sounds like an exciting day. Now, a lot of students are wondering what your favorite thing to eat in space was. 
Oh, yeah, this is a good question. We don't really understand it, but food tastes different in space and the tastes that you have change. We think it might have something to do with the sense of smell, which, of course, is very important to the concept of taste. But in microgravity, everything, all your sinuses and everything else just kind of opens up a little bit and sits there. And so we're not really sure why. For example, uh, chocolate does not taste sweet in space. It tastes bitter. So, but one of the things that uh, that we we have all noticed is that you really crave those intense flavors. And again, maybe it's because you have a, a reduced sense of smell. And so my favorite thing was shrimp cocktail. And that's a very, very popular meal. It's really spicy sauce. So you take the shrimp and you have to rehydrate them because they're they're uh, freeze dried so that they stay fresh because there's no refrigerator on the space station. Well, there's a little one, but it's for science, not really for food. Although occasionally we put some ice cream in there for like a day. Uh, but so you rehydrate it and then this really super tangy sauce. I just love that. And I can tell you even now, the crews on board the space station, they're always asking for more hot sauce. Well, I think uh, for some of us, that'd be quite quite a surprise getting up there and <laughs> eating lots of the hot sauce. Now, here's an interesting question. What are the flashes at night on the Earth when looking down from the ISS or the International Space? Well, generally, if you're looking down from the ISS at the Earth, what you're seeing normally is lightning. And uh, that is uh, just an amazing thing to see. You can see from this video that it's, uh, it's, it's sort of unpredictable. You just see these flashes and these pops. But what really it means to me when I would look at a cloud system and that kind of you, you, you had a sense that it was really interconnected. You really began to get a sense of the scale of a weather system. You know, we, we only look up and see a thunderstorm passing overhead. But when you can see from space a whole front and a whole line of thunderstorms and a whole region that's operating together, I will say that sometimes, not very often, we would see sprites. Now, sprites are something you should go do some research on, but it's little shooting jets that come up from the top of a thunderstorm. And when astronauts first started to see them, people were like, what are they? We didn't know. We had to do a bunch of research to figure it out because they're so short-lived, our regular cameras that are looking down at the Earth kind of missed them. But astronauts could see them. So it's teaching us a lot more about our atmosphere. So go look up sprites. That is really cool. You don't think about the other perspective. Now, Joanne from Harlem, New York, is wondering what do astronauts do if they get a little bored? <laughs> well, that's easy. If you are fortunate enough to be bored, generally the thing you want to do the most is go to the nearest window and watch the Earth roll by. It is just the most amazing sight. And sometimes uh, it might be exciting. You might be like, oh, I really want a picture of uh, Mount Everest or, you know, the Himalayas or something like that. But a lot of times you're actually looking for your own hometown, your own home state or places that you've visited and get your camera out and take a really nice picture so that you can send it down to your family and friends on Earth and share with the world because we share all the astronaut photography from space freely to anybody who wants it. And there's a lot of interesting science that has been done that way, not just sprites, but other things too. Now, it is true that sometimes uh, you just wanna be with other people. And so we've collected a variety of things. There are movies to watch on board. There's a guitar that you can play. And sometimes people have brought their hobbies with them. Like uh, one of my friends was a quilter. And so she brought quilting supplies and made a quilt on the space station. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I imagine no one brings anything uh, really loud like a trumpet. <laughs> uh, no, not to mind. A flute, a flute has gone to space before, though. <laughs> um, now, our... We're, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to go to our last couple questions. Juan from Kansas is wondering, what can I do right now to prepare for a career at NASA? 
Wonderful. Well, I'm going to say there's two things. The first one probably won't surprise you. It's it's to actually study. So uh, the the more you prepare at the age that you are now, the easier high school will be when you learn more advanced science and mathematics. And then the more prepared you are in high school, the better you will do when you go to college. And that's that's really important. If you want to be successful, you really do need to study and, and, and ask questions and be engaged and try to figure things out. Don't just memorize things. Really, really ask questions and try to understand them. Because engineering and science is about solving problems. And so it's not about memorizing things. So ask if you don't understand. It's really important to to because you're you're trying to solve problems. But I'm going to say another thing as well. One of the things when people ask me, especially about being an astronaut, is I remind them that you should practice being the kind of person that you would want to travel for six months to Mars with. Now, think about that for a minute. Some of the people in your classroom are probably maybe a little bit easier to get along with than others. Well, guess what? Just like studying, you can actually practice. And usually how we do that is by participating in team activities. And then you begin to understand how to be a good teammate and someday a leader, because someday we may put you in charge of NASA or in charge of the spacecraft going to Mars. So think about that and practice and be ready for that piece too. That's an excellent point. Now, our last question is from Anna in Florida, and she's wondering, how do you think you'll feel when you see the first woman walk on the moon? Really, really jealous. <laughs> oh, I'll be happy for her. I'm sure I'll be happy for her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't blame you. <laughs> if I was in <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be inspired too. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to cry. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of tears shed that day. Well, I want to thank you again, Pam, for coming out and talking to us, answering all of our wonderful student questions. It was great listening to all your stories. Well, it was wonderful talking with you too. And again, like I said before, I'm just excited. You're building a community. As you uh, grow and learn, you'll meet each other in college, you'll meet each other at NASA, you'll meet each other at some of our industry partners or at universities, and um, and you're getting started on building a community. You're the Artemis generation, that's what we call you. And uh, I am excited because I know someday all of this will be in your hands. Absolutely. So thanks to all of you for all your wonderful questions and stay tuned for more great collaborative events with NASA and the STEM Next Opportunity Fund. And before we go, we're going to take a quick look at how Artemis will pave the way to the moon and beyond. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible. With science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. 
This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so, we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the lunar south pole to establish the Artemis base camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes to assemble a complex ship in deep space. We will perfect ascending down to and returning from a distant surface. We will learn how humans can survive and thrive in a partial gravity environment. With improved spacesuit designs, mobile habitats, and with reconnaissance robots pre-positioning and relocating supplies. We will learn how to utilize the resources we find on these other worlds, starting with finding water ice and purifying it to drinkable water. And refining that into hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. We will establish fission power plants on the surface of the moon capable of supporting a growing community of efforts. And we will expand the logistics supply chain to enable commercial and international partners to resupply and refuel deep space outposts. None of this is simple or easy, but nothing in our history ever has been. The eagle has landed. We got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This kind of continuous lunar presence is a natural extension of all that we've learned in low Earth orbit. And what we will accomplish there will ensure the monumental missions to Mars are within reach as we ready the launch of the first Artemis mission and as commercial companies ready their lunar landers for the first private payload deliveries, we have already begun to take the next step.